in the silence of the birch wood, snow melting from branches. In the stillness of the birch wood, snow melting from branches. Snow on moss, on stone. Green ochre, russet gold, colours refreshed and released. Wash face with snow, taste snow, clap hands in clear air. Up on the ridge, Surrounded by light, standing at ease on crumbling rock. Where all is so insistently clear, it will not do. Something is hidden, a premise of which the facts are a residue. Nothing coincides with its representation. Stop, look, wait. The visible is fragile. The call of a whimbrel might split it apart. Light comes streaming down into a moment that is all encompassing. It is the ache of looking perceives behind appearances that which appears. Well, these are some poems from my new book, That Which Appears published by Carcanet Press. I'm rather surprised to find that it's quite a thick book, around 360 pages or so. But that's because it brings together four previous books, three of them published by Carcanet and the fourth one the earliest of the series, which gives its name to the new book, published by Paragon Press in 1994. So there are around 30 years of writing in this one book. It's possible to bring these four together because they do form a series. You might almost say that they are one long poem, a phenomenology of walking in the highlands and islands of Scotland. The poems attempt to get back to the things themselves. What seems to be common to both walking and writing is that they are both modes of inquiry. They're ways of actively going towards experience. So you might want to know what's happening up on the moor. How does it feel to be out in the air? What flowers are open along the coast? Or who are you when you look at the sea? Or when you step into the shade of a wood? It seems to be the case that perception is a shape changer. That to see is to be affected or that the outlines of things, the forms and colours, 
may be only a trick of light. That the return of light is always a kind of revelation. These are some of the preoccupations of the poems, some of the discoveries of walking. What are all the things that we miss if we are taken up in self-interest? Is there a footstep or a gaze that may be less predatory? If this book is one long poem, then the little fragments and notations which make up the book are also poems in themselves. They are responses to what's happened in the landscape, often taken down in the place on the occasion. They are necessarily brief, often only two or three lines long, because they try to stay faithful to the brevity of perception, to the singular, indivisible nature of the event as it happens. There's a lot of space in the book. And the space gives some sense of pace. You could think of the space as quiet around the pause, as a distance between things, so much ground that's been covered. Perhaps it's also a respect given to what the poem contains. And by that, <clears throat> I mean not only the hills and trees, the rocks and water, the traces of old farming practices, but also syllables and phonemes, a certain restricted vocabulary the sound and movement of the verse. Attention here has to be equal on both landscape and language, on what starts up underfoot or what develops in the writing. The book is structured around a few themes or motifs which are sprinkled throughout the book, often in pairs. So for instance, there is birch and pine, uh, yellow and blue, walking and waiting. And these are not opposites, but complementaries. They are modes or tonalities to play about in or to linger in or to move through. Another pair would be dawn and dusk. Each of the four books opens at dawn and closes dusk. The poems move through different terrain. They move through situations of perception and reflection, of arriving and leaving, situations of celebration and lament. There's always a lot to lament. So perhaps for that very reason, you might allow me a large measure of celebration. Anyway, <clears throat> here are a few more poems.
what remains is pollen, pine stumps and spores, coleopteran fragments, evidence of clearance, of erosion or acidification, precariously preserved in archives in bogs. Meadows of wind-loving flowers, ferns and fungi and mosses, produce great quantities of lightweight grains of pollen to be distributed broadly on currents of air. Suspended in clouds, fossilized in rocks, hidden in the lint in a jacket pocket, in furrows and fissures, dirt tracks and ditches, in pool and in hollow, deposits of the pollen of sycamore and willow, deposits of the pollen of meadowsweet and mallow, in pool and in hollow. When a warbler lights on a tall grass, grass and warbler dip and right themselves and swing. The things that mean most are spoken of least. From Bog Myrtle. When the mare canters across the meadow, a breeze stirs the fragrant grasses. Softly step over the boundaries in sunshine without fear. Brighter than soldiers in all their armour, is the one you love coming through clover. So that will maybe give you some flavour of the book. I'll finish off with a short poem made in collaboration with my friend Pip Haywood. It's got nothing at all to do with the Carcanet book. It's just a little bit of added value. So I hope you like the film and I hope you enjoy that which appears.